What on earth is a murder ballad? Those words don't even seem to go together. A ballad and murder? Why would anyone want to listen to a ballad about murder? Well, I was recently doing some research on bibliotherapy, and one of my favorite books is this one here by Sarah McNichol and Liz Brewster. And in one of their research studies, they talk about escapism, that often will read books to escape. And I'm sure many of you can relate to that. But when it comes to murder, it's not as uncommon as we might think. Anyone who watches uh, true crime, crime drama, anyone who likes to be entertained by maybe action movies or that, that often have violence and crime in them, it helps us to understand a little bit better why people might be drawn to what is called a murder ballad. So a ballad is not just a love song. It's actually a story set to poem or song. When you talk about murder ballads, you're talking about stories or poems about murder. When you look at the two words together, it kind of seems contradictory to why would you want to be entertained by ballads about murder. But today I'm going to explore that question and look at a couple of pieces of literature that are murder ballads and how they've maybe transformed over the years. So stay tuned. When I was doing some research for a bibliotherapy session I'm running for women in my community uh, based on an event that's taking place called Take Back the Night for women who have experienced violence, I came across this website, crimereads.com, and there was an article about murder ballads called A Window into the History of Violence Against Women. And it's a really fascinating article that led me to a uh, podcast called Songs in the Key of death. <laughs> Sounds kind of morbid, but it was really fascinating when I did more research to see that there are several podcasts uh, based on murder ballads. But this article um, in part says, the murder ballad has a long history. They take their cue from the ballad tradition, a musical form of storytelling. These songs were often based on true stories, real murders whose names have worn away with time. Murder ballads were part history, part gossip, and part folklore. At the core, the subgenre of murder ballads are about an innocent young woman led astray by a man, which inevitably leads to her murder. Murder ballads have twisted the truth over the years, turning victims into instigators, killers into heroes. Usually ballads are written to tell women how to behave. The podcast Songs in the Key of Death points out that it's important to have a critical eye about what we listen to and what is being said and what messages we're taking from what we're, what we're listening to. So let's look at one of these murder ballads. This is the story of Omi Wise or Naomi Wise. And what's interesting is that there are several versions of this story and this one is from 1973 by Doc Watson. So I'm just going to read the murder ballad. Oh listen to my story, I'll tell you no lies. How John Lewis did murder poor little Omi Wise. He told her to meet him at Adams Springs. He promised her money and other fine things. So, fool-like she met him at Adam Springs. No money he brought her, nor other fine things. Go with me, little Omi, and away we will go. We'll go and get married, and no one will know. She climbed up behind him, and away they did go, but off to the river where deep waters flow. John Lewis, John Lewis, will you tell me your mind? Do you intend to marry me, or leave me behind? Little Omi, little Omi, I'll tell you my mind. My mind is to drown you and leave you behind. Have mercy on my baby and spare me my life. I'll go home as a beggar and never be your wife. He kissed her and hugged her and turned her around, then pushed her in deep waters where he knew she would drown. He got on his pony and away he did ride as the screams of little Omi went down by his side. 
"'Twas on a Thursday morning, the rain was pouring down, "'when the people searched for Omi, but she could not be found. Two boys went a-fishing one fine summer day "'and saw little Omi's body go floating away. "'They threw their net around her and drew her to the bank. "'Her clothes all wet and muddy, they laid her on a plank. "'Then sent for John Lewis to come to that place "'and brought her out before him so that he might see her face.' He made no confession, but they carried him to jail. No friends or relations would go on his bail. What's interesting about this story is that it's more common than makes sense. These stories of trusting women putting their faith in the men that they fall in love with, the expectation that uh, they would be become their wife, especially at a, at a time sort of the pre-rights, women's rights movement, when when women were dependent 100% on their fathers and then their husbands. So when women were, were vulnerable and naive and trusting, and then maybe ended up pregnant or, you know, falling in love with these men, these murder ballads tell a story of how disposable these women were, how if the man didn't see her fitting into his life, or if she became pregnant and he didn't want responsibility, the easy way out for the man was just to murder her. So there's dozens upon dozens of stories set to song and poem about these these poor men that were suffering because a woman fell in love with them and became pregnant with their child and they couldn't be bothered to uh, respect her or to, to honor her position. Instead, the easiest thing for them to do was just to kill her and, uh, and be done with her. So it really perpetuates violence against women, making it commonplace, minimizing it like, oh, it's not a big deal. A woman is disposable. So these murder ballads, they really send a disturbing message even today. In the Songs in the Key of Death podcast that I referred to, there's an episode on Omi Wise, and it talks about how there's um, collectors and archivists refer to uh, countless European murder ballads that really tell, tell the story about promiscuous women being washed clean by drowning, right? So these murder ballads really... The, the narrative depends on who's telling the story. Is it uh, society and wanting to make excuses for, for the men? Or is it the story of the women? So it really depends on who's narrating the story. Um, but this, this last paragraph I took from the transcript, it says, As for the Omi Wise, her real story isn't one of a proper lady or a beautiful, helpless creature. It's more complex than a song about how one romance went bad. We remember her, thanks to the song that has survived her, as a woman who was deceived and drowned in the river. We remember the myth of her, and we should remember her as the woman who stood up to a lying man, demanding a better life for herself and her baby. If there is any moral to be had in the story of Omi Wise, it's that we can keep rewriting her story and choose to mythologize her not as a victim, but as a woman who was sick of this shit and wasn't going to take it anymore. So again, it really depends on the narrative, who's telling the story, and what kind of cultural structure the narrator comes from. Is it is it one of hyper-religiosity or one of kind of the the old historical references to, to women, the, the backwards narratives about uh, women's roles perpetuating gender stereotypes and gender inequality. So it's, it's really interesting looking at the story of Omi Wise and how it could be translated depending on who's telling the story. Fast forward to the 20th century, what you'll find is that a lot of women started writing murder ballads. I, I believe Dolly Parton is one of the one of the artists that has written a murder ballad. Um, but I came across this one um, that was posted, I think, in, in the article on Crime Reads called Goodbye Earl, Song by the Chicks. Let me just read what the, uh, the lyrics say in this song. Marianne and Wanda were the best of friends. 
all through their high school days, both members of the 4-H club, both active in the FFA. After graduation, Mary Ann went out looking for a bright new world. Wanda looked all around this town, and all she found was Earl. Well, it wasn't two weeks after she got married that Wanda started getting abused. She'd put on dark glasses and long sleeve blouses and makeup to cover a bruise. While she finally got the nerve to file for divorce, she let the law take it from there. But Earl walked right through that restraining order and put her in intensive care. Right away, Marianne flew in from Atlanta on a red-eye midnight flight. She held Wanda's hand and they worked out a plan and it didn't take them long to decide that Earl had to die. I really appreciate the lyrics of this murder ballad. Basically, women standing up for themselves, expressing in song how, well, like the last reference, they're not going to take this shit anymore when, when they start being abused. Now, I'm not advocating for <laughs> violence, of course, in, in, any, in any manner, but it's fascinating to see how, you know, the narrative starts changing, how women start expressing their displeasure, their unhappiness, their frustration, and their, you know, maybe helplessness in, in being abused. So what's interesting about this is I, I read this and then about two days later, I was, I was driving and there was a car in front of me with a bumper sticker uh, that said, Earl's in the trunk. And honestly, had I not read this uh, murder ballad, I wouldn't have known what that meant. But the, the connection was just, it was kind of ironic to see that bumper sticker right after. I'm not encouraging you to go out and, you know, make a plan to take down, take down violent men, maybe let the law handle that. But certainly writing these kinds of lyrics is a form of escapism, kind of like what I was talking about from, from this book, how we escape through storytelling, through, through true crime, through reading books, books where we can, you know, like say for instance, Dexter, <laughs> you know, it's the, the vigilantes, the, um, the vicarious vengeance <laughs> that, that we might be able to get that the escapism through watching it or reading about other people doing things maybe that we are, are secretly repressing. <laughs> A poet that I recently discovered is Nikita Gill. I bought this book, Wild Embers, and it's amazing how women who've been abused, who've suffered trauma, can often express themselves through poetry and through memoir and storytelling. But there are several good poems in this book by Nikita Gill, and I thought I'd share two of them with you. This one kind of relates to the murder ballad uh, scenario. So let me read it. Little Red Riding Hood, it's called. Girls who survive trauma wear a certain vulnerability around them, and some men are wolves. They look for those girls, their eyes hungry for prey, their tongues filled with lies to pull girls like this back into the void they have just escaped from. Little Red Riding Hood was a survivor, too, and once, when a man had taken a step too far, she had told the story of what she did to the last thing that tried to devour her. I let the wild seep in, she said, her voice perilously low. I let him think he was going to win, but little did he know. I bear teeth too, sharper than his, and a heart that has survived terrible pain, young. When he tried to devour me, I took the axe from the basket and hacked until he was done. If you want to know the secret, if you want to know the truth, there is nothing more dangerous than a girl who is aware of the flames inside her and all the damage she can do. Yes, girls who survive trauma do wear a certain vulnerability around them, but this kind of vulnerability is from where their greatest strength stems. This kind of talks to the strength of women and sometimes women that have experienced trauma who've been pushed just a little too far, if not far too far, will come out fighting 
and stand up for themselves and take action into their own hands the way this like this one is described here another story that she shares called sleeping beauty i really really like this one too because it refers to consent so if you're if you're looking for a poem about consent to share with your your daughters this is this is a really good one so i'll read it it's called sleeping beauty the version of sleeping beauty i tell my daughter will be a fairy tale about consent before it is a fairy tale about true love. In it, I will pause and ask her, do you think it was right for the prince to kiss a girl who was unconscious just because he thinks she's pretty? And I expect her to say, no, no, it is not. In my story, Aurora will not marry the prince. In my story, Aurora will stand tall, say no to a marriage with a man she barely knows and rule her father's kingdom all on her own. I will use this story to help her understand no boy has the right to touch her without her consent just because he thinks she's pretty. I will teach her to say the word no before she learns yes. I will teach her that others may think she is being difficult, but no one's opinion matters as much as her own. And most important of all, I will teach her never to feel guilty or wear her body as though it is a gift to anyone except herself. So again, it's fascinating that women who've experienced trauma and abuse like uh, Nikita Gill are able to express through poem their empowerment. And this empowerment helps other women. It, it helps others escape their own trauma and their own difficulties through their writing. So if you're so inclined, write if, if ever you have something to say and you think no one's listening, no one cares, first of all, it'll help you. It's the expressive writing process where you, you get negative thoughts out of your head and onto paper that will help you. But you never know how fast forward in the future with no expectations, you might be able to package the, the poems you've written in such a way that it will help other women as well. I'm going to read one more song lyrics for you, and this is from uh, Dua Lipa, Boys Will Be Boys. As I read it, you will probably be singing it, but anyways, I'll, I'll read most of it, but the chorus, I'll let you just sing it to yourself. <clears throat> it says, it's second nature to walk home before the sun goes down and put your keys between your knuckles when there's boys around. Isn't it funny how we laugh it off to hide our fear? when there's nothing funny here. Sick intuition that they taught us so we won't freak out. We hide our figures doing anything to shut them out. We smile a way to ease the tension so it won't go south, but there's nothing funny now. When will we stop saying things? Cause they are all listening. No, the kids ain't all right. Oh, and they do what they see cause it's all on TV. The kids ain't all right. And then there's the chorus, boys will be boys, but girls will be women. I'm sure if there's something that I can't find the words to say, I know that there'll be a man around to save the day. And that was sarcasm in case you needed it mansplained. I should have stuck to ballet. If you're offended by this song, you're clearly doing something wrong. If you're offended by this song, then you're probably saying boys will be boys boys will be boys. This was one of the first songs that really struck a chord with me after I was attacked uh, four years ago now because I never really gave it much thought about not being trusting of boys or, or, or the men around me. I, <clears throat> I was very trusting and, and naive, I guess you could say. I also have a loving and wonderful husband and a wonderful son. They're both peace-loving men. So I never really anticipated being attacked. I never anticipated being traumatized. So when I came across this song uh, shortly after I came home, I, I was like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, we say boys will be boys. The boys are just doing what boys do, you know. They, they can't control their sexual urges or their violent urges. It, it really doesn't make any sense. Well, I hope you've learned something today. 
I certainly have learned a lot in the last year while studying bibliotherapy. For instance, coming across terms like murder ballads, something I had never heard of before, but it took me down a bit of a research rabbit hole where I discovered an entire genre of literature or creative art that I wasn't aware of before. And that is one of the benefits of bibliotherapy. It is a, an informal learning tool. We discover a lot through books. We escape through books. We experience catharsis and healing through books. And really any kind of written text, whether it's song lyrics, poems, fiction, nonfiction, and, and so on. So I'll keep posting bibliotherapy sessions on a variety of topics. And I do encourage you to engage with the material, leave a comment below, ask questions. One of the benefits of non-clinical bibliotherapy, which is what I offer, is often that in, in groups, we have discussions about uh, literature that's shared. So we'll read a poem or a text or a song lyric and then talk about it. So so in this context where it's one way and it's just a video, we might not get that, but uh, we can certainly create conversation in text in the comments below. So feel free to leave a comment about murder ballads or any other comments you might have and suggestions for future bibliotherapy sessions. But stay tuned for more. I will be posting one every week and hopefully we'll grow from there. Thanks for watching and be positive.